All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Phil Levy. I am Senior Fellow on the Global Economy here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. We very much appreciate you joining us for our first program of the fall season and the first program in our Global Economy series. We hope you all had a very good summer and you are as excited as we are for the coming year. The Council has a full, exciting season of programming and studies releases planned, um, quite of which are available online and you can uh, see them there. We would like to give special thanks to our members in attendance today. Your support is critical to our work. If you are not yet a member, the beginning of the season is the perfect time to join. We have a wide range of levels for you to choose from. We would also like to thank CFA Society Chicago, our partner for this event. The Chicago Council on Global Affairs is an independent and nonpartisan platform. Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Today's event is on the record. We are live streaming and we welcome your social media engagement. Later, we will be taking audience questions from the room or online at, and then we have our sort of weird URL, which is chi.cnf.io. That's chi.cnf.io. So you can go there and post questions and um, I might even pose them to our guest. So, before I turn it over to our speaker today and yield the floor, I'll be coming back to discuss things with him a little later, a few brief words of uh, introduction. Uh, Rafael Bostic is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. He also serves on the Federal Reserve's Chief Monetary Policy Body, the Federal Open Market Committee. Before he took up his position at the Atlanta Fed, he was the Judith and John Bedrosian Chair in Governance and Public Enterprise at the University of Southern California's School of Public Policy. Over the course of his career, his research has focused on a number of topics, including home ownership, housing finance, neighborhood change, and the role of institutions in policy development. Well before all of that, he was an engaging young graduate student in Stanford University's PhD program in economics and a reasonably good member of our department's intramural football team, which is where I first, that's where I first got to know him. I got to meet him. And so that makes it a special pleasure to have him here with us this evening for a, an initial talk and then a conversation with me and with all of you. So President Bostic will first give these remarks. I'll be back, but please join me right now in welcoming to the podium Raphael Bostic. Good evening, everyone. So uh, I learned, I've learned, I've been in, in Atlanta for about a little more than a year, and they always expect sort of a call response sort of thing. So, so good evening, everyone. It's really good to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be in Chicago and uh, to see Phil again. You know, those, those were good football days. We, we uh, you know, every year we would play Berkeley and the econ departments would play each other and we crushed them, it was great. <laughs> uh, and I, I wanna thank the council for inviting me to be here. It's always good to, to get out and to talk about economics and to talk about economics with people who are excited to talk about it. Uh, I've been through uh, my district a lot in the last year and a bit. And one thing that has been really clear is that for many economics is something that people worry about. They're scared of it, they're intimidated by it, and um, I think that has not served us well. And so one of my missions is really to try to talk about uh, the economy, uh, people's role in the economy, uh, how to make plans and decisions, uh, to uh, take advantage of opportunities in ways that people understand and uh, hopefully give them some homework so that they can go and do things and get to a better position. Uh, so I'm looking for some of that tonight, but I'm, I'm, I trust that you have lots of other things you'd like to talk about as well. Uh, what I think thought I would do for uh, my remarks uh, to open this up is just talk a little bit about uh, the economy, uh, how I'm viewing it, and how uh, my team at the Atlanta Fed is thinking about things, uh, and, uh, and then uh, talk a little bit about uh, diversity in economics, because I think it's an important thing to, to discuss. And then I'll ask Phil to come up and we can have a little discussion before we open it up to you. So how's the economy doing? Uh, we have a dual mandate at the Fed, uh, maximum employment and stable prices. And by both those metrics, the economy is performing quite well. So in our uh, uh, maximum employment metric, 
Uh, one way you might think about this is you know, how many people are employed and how is that compared to what we're seeing, uh, what is possible. Uh, our unemployment rate is 3.9%. Uh, if you think about what full employment is, uh, most analysts have it much higher than that. I think uh, it's not as high as many analysts think, but uh, we're, the unemployment rate is below where our natural employment rate, uh, natural unemployment rate should be. Uh, which suggests that we're at full employment. We're doing uh, quite well. It, uh, many people are being employed, uh, having gainful income, and that's a good thing. And we think about the second mandate, which is stable prices. Uh, the Fed, before I got here, called out 2% uh, in uh, PCE uh, inflation as our target, and that's exactly where we are. Now, we hadn't been there for a long time, uh, for five or six years, uh, but today we are at 2%, and uh, the price level seems to be growing at a, at a sustainable and measured pace, which is quite good. Uh, this all translates into uh, what we hope is a sustainable growth trajectory for the economy, and that's what I'm hoping will happen as well. You know, GDP is growing, we're in the two and a half, three, three and a half percent range, which is quite healthy, and uh, we are not seeing signs of rapid acceleration, which would suggest that the economy is overheating in any way. So I think, in general, we are at a, a very uh, solid position, and that's a, that's a good thing. Now, what does that mean for, for our policies, for monetary policy? In my view, uh, when the economy is doing well and standing on its own, uh, then our policy should be uh, neutral. Now, coming out of the Great Recession about 10 years ago, uh, the Fed acted to move its policy position to a full stimulus position. We reduce interest rates dramatically. Uh, we added a lot of assets to our balance sheet, and all in the in the in the uh, goal with the goal of stimulating the economy, making sure it didn't collapse any further. Uh, now that the economy is standing on its own, it's my view that we should be trying to uh, move our policy back to a more neutral stance. So get our interest rate back into a more normal position, return our balance sheet to a more normal position, and that's exactly what we're doing today. Um, and so I'm very supportive of that move to normal, and I hope and anticipate that we will be able to continue to do that over the next 12 to 18 months. Now, that's a high general story about how the economy is performing. Uh, but in the year that I've been in, in the 6th District, the head of the 6th District, you know, I've traveled around uh, my area. My area is Florida, Georgia, Alabama, the bottom half of Mississippi, the bottom half of Louisiana, and the eastern two-thirds of Tennessee. And that's a very diverse uh, marketplace. And as you go through, and as I've traveled through that area, uh, a thing that struck me is that, well, there are many places that are doing quite well, there are many places that are not sharing in that prosperity and that opportunity. And so, uh, you know, I, as we talk about a, a United States economy, I actually think that there are, are multiple United States economies. And depending where you are, uh, people are having very different experiences in terms of prosperity, in terms of hope, in terms of access to opportunity. And as I think about our policy and the things that we can do at, at the Fed, you know, I, I, my background, kind of pulls me into this space. But I think it's important to remember that that, that that top line average number is just an average. And there's a lot of variation across there. And we need to be making sure that uh, our institution continues to engage and reaches out to engage uh, people who are experiencing the full range of the economy. I could sit in Atlanta. Atlanta is doing quite well and is booming. But I'd be missing a lot of the story about how the economy is performing. And I'm fortunate in that our bank has set up a structure uh, that really um, incentivizes and prioritizes reaching out and talking to as many people on the ground as possible. So I have five branch offices, um, and we have people in those branches who are t tasked with just going out and talking to people, talking to CEOs, talking to community groups, talking to others, to get a sense on the ground about what's happening. And in every FOMC cycle, that's the cycle that uh, for the FMC is the body that, that sets uh, the federal funds rate. Uh, that happens in a six-week cycle. Every six weeks we meet. Um, over that cycle, we try to get to at least 100 to 120 different 
people, to have one-on-one -on -one conversations about, with them about what's happening. We try to span the entire uh, space of our economy in terms of sector and geography, so that I have an on-the-ground appreciation for how the economy is operating. And that's been quite helpful, and I think it'll be uh, important as we move forward, because one view I have is that uh, trends start happening before they show up in aggregate data. And I want to make sure that our institution is on top of things in real time so that we can act on time. And if we can do that well, that will be uh, quite good. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uncertainties moving forward, the risks to the economy. So um, I think the risks are largely balanced. On the one hand, we've had a significant stimulus in the form of tax reform as well as in the form of the spending package that the Congress passed and the President signed. Um, those uh, have definitely touched the economy, uh, but they haven't come through the economy as robustly and, and as timely as I had expected. So I had expected the tax reform package. Firms have uh, lots of cash now on hand. Uh, consumers, households, families do as well. And I thought that would just burst itself into the economy and we'd see a lot of change. That actually hasn't happened so directly. Uh, for businesses, for many of them, it took uh, a while to figure out exactly what the, uh, the optimal corporate form would be given all the tax changes. The tax changes were quite complex. Uh, and for many, they're still, they're still working on that. So that, that the available funds have not been immediately deployed. Uh, which has implications for when we should expect to see that hit to growth. Uh, consumers on the same side, households, uh, for many, the big chunk I'm expecting will come up in April of next year when you get your tax refund. Uh, and so um, for many families, um, they're not seeing huge lump sums. And if you look at the consumption data, it's strong, but it is not as strong as, uh, as I had expected coming into the year. So there's more to come, and there's a lot of upside potential in that space. On the other hand, um, there is a lot of uncertainty in the economy today. Much of it has to do with trade policy. I've been talking with Phil uh, a lot about that uh, today. He knows more about trade than I do, so any questions that you might have later on, we should direct to him. Uh, but uh, but the, the changes in the trade rules uh, have introduced a lot of uncertainty for businesses. Uh, and uh, when, when I talked to businesses, I was talking to a bunch of business folks today at lunch. I asked them, what's the one thing you want? And it is certainty in the rules. Just tell, if you talk to any business person, they say, tell us what the rules are. If I know what the rules are, I'll figure out how to succeed in that environment. Right now, we're in an environment where the rules are changing uh, continuously. And there's not a good sense at least from the business people that I've talked to, that, uh, that we know exactly where those rules are going to settle. And in that context, it's difficult for business leaders to know uh, what a good long-term investment plan looks like, because we don't know sort of how that's going to fit against the rules. And so that uncertainty is causing uh, many of the businesses that I've talked to uh, to take a step back and say, let me just wait and see what happens before uh, we take any actions. So that wait and see is a counter to uh, let's get invest and do things. Right? And, and as time has passed, uh, the wait and see sentiment has grown. And uh, that growth has led me to, to see them as the two sides is really being balanced. They're almost perfectly counterbalancing each other. And we'll have to see what happens moving forward uh, as to uh, whether I still think they're balanced or I think we, we've moved into a more negative or a more positive direction. But this is something that we are monitoring closely. We have lots of surveys out in the field as we speak to try to understand how businesses are grappling with uh, today's policy environment. And it's, it's an important question and it's largely unresolved as we speak. I think the Canadians are negotiating right now. So uh, I don't have any people in the room, so I don't know how that's going to turn out. All right, so, so uh, just want to put that out there in terms of general economy. I did want to say one thing about um, our field. So I'm an economist by training. Uh, I have a lot of economists and finance and business people, uh, business grads who work at my bank, and I interact with them a lot. 
And uh, I have been uh, disappointed that our field is not as diverse in its representation as the population is. I talk a lot about diversity uh, in my, about my institution and about, uh, about businesses. I think that diversity actually makes our products better. In my experience, uh, the teams that I have been on that have been diverse have had some of the more difficult conversations, uh, but those conversations have led ideas to be challenged in ways that are thorough and complete. Uh, and so anything that survives in that environment it, you know is rock solid. You know is going to do well in, in the public sphere. And so uh, from my personal experience, I know when I've worked on diverse teams, they push me hard, it's, it's challenging, uh, but the product that we wind up with is a lot better than it would be if I was with myself or with a, with a bunch of people who thought exactly like I did. Uh, and I think the same applies in uh, academic and analytic pursuits. So uh, in economics and finance, we don't have uh, nearly the, per the representation of uh, women or minorities in the field. And I think what that's led to is um, our field considering a narrower set of questions than we might have otherwise, and uh, having some conventional wisdoms that, uh, about what drives people to make decisions uh, that are less informed than they could be. And I think that hurts us analytically, and it has us, uh, leaves us in a place that uh, means that we understand how the economy works a lot uh, less than we could otherwise. Uh, so our bank, I'm pushing our bank to really be out in the forefront to find solutions, to get more people to understand and appreciate economics from a very early age so that, um, so that when, they, when they get to college, they think about economics as a major. Right now, not enough people do that. Uh, and when they're in college, they think about getting a PhD uh, as, a, as a worthy pursuit. Now, we've spent a lot of effort at the Fed uh, doing things uh, to try to promote people moving into the PhD level. Uh, I think that uh, we need to spend more effort looking at the K through 12 experience in economics. I've talked to a lot of folks around, and when they tell me about their kids' experience, they all say, that first econ class is horrible, and they never want to be an econ again. I was like, well, that's a problem. All right, so, so we're going to try as much as possible to work with educators. We have, I have a great team at the bank. Uh, who is uh, thinking about how do you do economics education in an excellent way that engages students, and uh, hopefully you will be seeing more about that uh, in the months to come. Because I think uh, in terms of long-term impact, uh, that is one that can be uh, quite important uh, moving forward. So that's what I plan to say. So uh, thank you for listening to me, and I think I'm moving over here. Well, thank you for that. That's, that's terrific. I want to sort of come back and uh, re-explore a number of the things you, you talked about. And let's start with the state of the economy that you gave. And you talked about the natural rate of unemployment. Why do we think there is something which is sort of a natural rate of unemployment? Isn't it a good idea for everyone to be employed? Yes. So just, <laughs> I know there are media here. Yes, we want everyone employed, right? <laughs> Um, so the, 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 the concept of the natural rate of unemployment mm -hmm. is that it takes time to match. Okay. So if you're working, there's a job, you're, you're, you're miserable in your job, you want to quit, so you quit. It's going to take time for you to find that next job. Mm -hmm. If you're an employer and you're looking to fill a position, uh, it may not be the first applicant that fits that, that, that position perfectly. And so with that time, that means that there's going to be time when positions are open, when people are not working. And so that, that's the concept between a natural rate of unemployment. Everyone's trying to get a job, but just informational frictions, transport frictions, all those sorts of things uh, come into play. And what's been interesting is that um, I've become, like we, we've been asking a lot of questions about you know, how are people doing job search? Mm -hmm. And one thing that I've seen is that uh, the phone and technology has become an important vehicle for job searching. Right, so there are a lot of apps out there that allow for, for matching. 
Uh, a lot of the placement companies use that as well. And what that means is that the time to match is shrinking. Right, so when I left grad school, when I left, left California, uh, people were talking about the natural rate in the five and a half, six percent range. Now it, the CBO has it, I think, 4.8 percent. I actually think it's less than that. Do you All have right. a number? Um, you don't have to. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, I, I'm, I think it's in the 4.2, 4.3 range right now. Okay. Which, uh, is, which is still above where we are. It is above where we are, but it's not a whole percentage point above where we are. That's right. You know, one of the puzzles in, in labor markets is, you know, once you get to full employment, that, that, that should imply a degree of scarcity of workers. And if you're if a scarcity of workers, then employers, if you want to get workers, you've got to offer them more and pay. And if you look at wages, we're not seeing uh, uh, ramping up of uh, wage growth, which is not consistent with the idea that there are scarce workers. Uh, now, if you're a full percentage point below the full employment level, that makes no sense whatsoever. Okay. But if you're close, you know, it may be that the sector you're in is kind of at full employment. There, there's going to be variations sector to sector, and you might not expect to see such a dramatic wage move. All right, so in a way, we're kind of groping around for that level a little bit and, and watching. But well, what is it we watch for? Is, would it be wages? Would it be compensation? How, how do you know if we've hit this point? So this is a, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about this. Uh, I mentioned that I go and I talk to business leaders and we get pull them in and I, I've been asking this question. First question, are you finding it hard to find workers? Yes. And they all say yes. And the second question, are you offering them more in wages? No. But that's usually what, what you hear. Now, it's less so now, uh, but when I first started, it was like, no, we're not doing that. I was like, well, why aren't you doing that? I said, well, you know, some people, they don't actually need the full wage, so we'll pay them in, in other ways. We'll give them alternative work schedule. We'll allow them to bring, you know, the pet to work. We'll, we'll allow them to dial in. Like, there are lots of other ways that people can be compensated. And then another factor that I think is, is important to, to consider is there's a psychological factor. So coming out of the Great Recession, you know, employers were scarred. They had to lay off a lot of people. They had not had to do that for a long time. And workers were scarred. They were expecting they were going to be the next layoff. Right? In that context, it may be that neither is really interested in, well, employers are not going to be as interested in taking on long-term commitments in terms of workers. So they may sort of forbear. And workers may not be as aggressive and demanding out of the memory and say, oh, I'm just glad I have a job. Let me just stay where I am. And so you know, I think that there is a psychology to the Great Recession that, uh, that is also sh reshaping how our, our markets work. You can think about the Great Recession, a Great Depression. Yeah. Right? So the generation that lived through the Great Depression, they saved a whole lot more than everybody else. Because mm -hmm. they had that in their memory. I think there's some of that that's also going on here today. This is always the part sort of economics versus psychology gets a little bit tricky. Well, you know, I was both, right? So I was a psych major oh. and an econ major. So, so. You're, you're fully qualified. Exactly. Um, well, I don't so, know about fully, but. <laughs> so, but then the question is, how long would that sort of new mindset last? Does this mean that the Fed doesn't need to worry about the dual part of the mandate anymore? Price stability is all taken care of? Uh, or the, you know, how, how does one know how that will sort of play out over time? So it's impossible to know ex ante how it's going to play out. All I can hope for is that um, through our engagement with the economy, with the members of the economy, that we will be able to detect these changes, if there are changes in psychology, in real time, and then be able to incorporate that into our modeling. You know, we, uh, this is one of the reasons why, why we spend a lot of time just trying to talk to people. Yeah. Because you learn things when you talk to people. And, um, it's dangerous to just sit in your office and have, get big data sets and run some models because you know, people are not that clean in terms of their decision making yeah. as compared to what a model would predict. And so understanding sort of where the gray area is and, and that the precision of a model gives you a, more of a direction than a hard point estimate is something I try to keep in my head all the time. So what are that said, either in this sort of aggregate data or in your conversations with people, what are the sorts of things that would make you worry more that, ooh, we found the, you know, the natural rate and we've maybe pushed too far past it? What, what would set off alarm bells? 
So, you know, if, if I were hearing from uh, employers uh, that, you know, we are, we are increasing wages across the board for all job categories, uh, even those that I didn't know we were scarce in, that would suggest that there's, a lot, there's something different going on. Right now, what, what, what employers tell me is, you know, I'm paying a lot for tech people. I'm paying a lot for cybersecurity people. If you're in a hospital, you'll pay more for nurses because we have a shortage there. Then we have shortage in trucking. So if you're a truck driver, you can get a good wage. Uh, but it's still very surgical in terms of where that is. And it's not, at least in the data that I'm seeing, uh, such a general thing to suggest that inflation is about to uh, ramp up dramatically. Okay. Now, you mentioned PCE as this thing where there's effectively a 2% target. Why that? Seems like there are a number of things one could, just personal consumption expenditures. Why would one focus on that? And it sounds like you don't put too much stake in it. You treat it as well, it, it, it's our metric, so I, you know, I, right, have, okay. I have to pay attention to you, it. Right. But, but you know, there are many different uh, price indexes. Uh, you have the consumer price index, which most people know. There's a producer price index. There's a personal consumption expenditure index. You know, all of these have different features. They have different baskets of, of goods. So you know, you know, the way an index works is uh, you take a basket of goods and you track how prices evolve over time. You look at the same basket every month, every year moving forward and see how that changes. Uh, the thing that, uh, now I was not at the Fed when they chose the PCE things, uh, but a couple things were, uh, were of value. One, it covers a broader range of expenditures than CPI. So CPI is just spending uh, by households directly. The PCE includes expenditures on healthcare that may have insurance associated with it. So you're getting a much broader picture of uh, the, the cost space. A second is that um, the weighting that happens of the different goods in the basket, um, it, re it revises more frequently. And so it gives you, I think there's a belief that it gives you a more uh, consistent, contemporaneous picture of what's going on. Uh, and those things uh, have given you know, the, the Fed machinery confidence that it's, that, that it's a, a really reliable and useful and consistent measure. When you see 2%, you know exactly what that means. All that said, you know, we look at every, every metric. Uh, every, all, we look at multiple price indexes. And indeed, there are conversion factors. Because you know, over the course of a month, um, you get the different releases. If I've got a meeting or a decision that, and the PC number hasn't come out, you know, the CPI may be the most recent thing that I have. And so we've got to have ways to use that and incorporate that into our decision making as well. Okay. I mean, so I want to ask you about bubbles. Um, that sort of our, our sort of standard theory on this, what you were sort of describing was this idea that if you pump too much money into the economy, or if you allow interest rates to be too low, sort of an equivalent statement, that we'll start to see prices pick up and indicators like the PCE will go too fast. What some people worry is that instead that extra money kind of accumulates somewhere else in a bubble to burst. And so Donald Cohn, the former Fed Vice Chairman, recently said that spots of exuberance were becoming visible in the US, including in commercial real estate, lending to highly leveraged companies, and in some asset values. Have you seen any spots of exuberance lately? Far less than what we saw in 2008, right? So That's sort of comforting. It should be very. <laughs> it should be very comforting. Okay. All right. So What's very comforting. All right. uh, here's what I would say: commercial real estate. Uh, let, let me back up. The Great Recession was very difficult, and it was difficult in my district more than in any other district in the country. So we had more bank failures than anywhere else. The foreclosures, we were at the top of the list. A lot of it was around commercial real estate. A lot of it was around land speculation. Uh, and so there's a lot of sensitivity that we have about the types of risks that would embed in systems that we routinely regulate. So my examiners, they go to the banks. We're pretty explicit with them now that you know we have ideas about how much exposure we're going to be comfortable with you taking in particular markets. I think we are much more direct and explicit about that today than we were a decade ago. And a lot of that is uh, the learning that's come out of uh, the Great Recession experience. 
Now, that said, there's, there's a possibility for risk to bubble up in a lot of different places, many of which we have not historically had a regulatory oversight authority for. Uh, and so there's a lot of activity that's growing in non-bank uh, financial institutions. And we are right now trying to think hard about how we might uh, engage with those institutions and engage marketplace uh, to understand whether the risks are starting to get to frothy levels or the unbounded exuberant levels. Uh, and then if they are, what types of steps we can take to, to address that. Uh, one thing I would say, our, our, one of our missions is to uh, prevent systemic risk, right? Things that can lead to broad systemic breakdown, very close to what we got in 2008. Uh, I think we have many more eyes looking on this now, uh, system-wide, than we did back then. And it gives me confidence that, um, that we have a, a high likelihood of noticing things that need to be uh, unpacked uh, in ample time to, to act prudently. So you did a nice job with the, um, with the wage question, or what would be alarming. What does a bubble look like? You said you have all these eyes watching. What are they watching for? How, how do you know it when you see it? So uh, I would say uh, a couple things on this. One, we have a range of experiences uh, over the course of this, this, this country's history in various financial sectors. We know what, over a long run uh, what an average performance looks like, and we can tease out a distribution of what that performance could be. If we start to see things that suggest that we're at the tail end, far from where average is, that should start to raise some red flags that we might want to understand that better to see whether there's something fundamental that's changed that means that that's not really the tail anymore, or whether there are viewpoints or perspectives that are being taken which would suggest that you know people are just being happy, right? And we need to like step back and say, okay. You need to be less happy and remember that this is a distribution. Um, and so, so there's a lot that happens. When you think about what happened in housing and people's uh, willingness or businesses' willingness to provide credit under circumstances that were n unprecedented at the scale that was unprecedented, that, was, that should have raised red flags and it did f for many. So for, for what I'm looking for is those sorts of examples a second thing I'm, I'm trying to be sensitive to is, for lack of a better word, hubris, right? And so, you know, another thing that, that I think happened in the financial crisis was we built tools and, and um, strategies that were highly sophisticated, and we kind of convinced ourselves that we could design ourselves away from risk. And that was part of the rationalization, right? That even when people saw the unusual pricing, they said, well, it's different now because we've done these tools and we don't need to worry about this. Right, we've distributed it all around, all that kind yeah. of stuff. Uh, those types of arguments should make us all nervous. Now, when you start hearing people say, oh, I've managed all the risk and we don't have risk anymore, um, you know something's about to happen. So, so we're, I'm very sensitive to the conversations that people have and, uh, and uh, the, the mindset that's prevailing in a marketplace as to sort of how they think about risk. Uh, and then a third thing I would say is um, leverage is always an issue, right? As when you get to uh, uh, a high level of debt versus equity investment, uh, then accountability starts to go to other entities beyond the actors. Uh, and that can be quite problematic, and that can be a sign that there is going to be there's a potential for some contagion that that I need to be concerned about. Okay, but I want to move to ask a couple things about sort of balance sheet and this the quantitative easing stuff. You talked about in, in your remarks about moving towards something that's sort of more neutral. What is neutral when it comes to the balance sheet, or what ought neutral to be? Um, that we we went. What was it, something like 800? We were at uh, about 900 billion. Right. And uh, through uh, the crisis, we moved to 4.5 trillion. Okay. All right, so the balance sheet increased fivefold uh, as, a, as a device to try to keep the economy moving. Uh, so normalization is not 4.5 trillion. Okay. Right. And, 
And we are moving back from that. And we started this about a year ago in a very kind of systematic, uh, just uh, rule-based approach that says we're going to roll off a certain amount every month. Uh, the question is, to what? And um, that's, that's a hard question to answer. So I'm having this conversation with my team right now. Like, what do we think is appropriate? I will tell you that uh, some technical changes in the marketplace suggest that we're not going back to $1 billion. Uh, it, I'm guessing and expecting it'll be closer to the $3 billion, the $3.5 billion range, uh, for a couple of reasons. So one, um, the demand for cash has gone up. It's doubled since 2010. Didn't we uh, think it was supposed to be the opposite? That was, you know, or pay, you know, paying electronically and the like? Well, maybe for you. I, I, I pay cash, right? All so, right. Uh, All right. Uh, but but uh, part of this is uh, financial uh, interest from foreign foreign parties. Yeah. So the demand for dollars uh, to and and it's the the confidence people have in its sustained value is important. A second has to do with um, reserve requirements and banks' willingness and desire to hold reserves. That's, that's another obligation for us. A third is, is Treasury, the, the Treasury Department. They do a bunch of devices that have implications for our balance sheet. Uh, so all of these have changed in ways that suggest that our, our steady state balance sheet should be larger than where it was before. And uh, now we just need to come to a consensus is about you know, when are we at the stopping roll? And uh, I'm, I expect that we will have uh, a view on that in several months. Uh, we don't have, I don't have that number in my head right now. Okay, well, that's pretty and, and this is a sort of little cue to the audience that I'm gonna be coming to you in a moment. Um, but along those lines, there's been some discussion recently about what one sees in the yield curve, the sort of difference between long dated and, and short dated bonds. And traditionally a flattening has maybe shown a, a slowing down. People have said though with the Fed, or, and not just the Fed of course, it's other central banks as well, having gotten involved in sort of broader ownership, maybe those signals aren't what they used to be. How do you think about the yield curve? Is it sending us useful signals? Um, so the yield curve is a so a couple things on the yield curve. One, it's a signal, right? And it's a signal what the market thinks uh, the economy is going to do, and then in turn how the Fed's going to respond to it. Um, now, it, it's a signal of other things as well because other parties buy uh, U.S. bonds for reasons that aren't tied to underlying economic performance, mm -hmm. and so. One, one thing I've asked my team to do is really evaluate to what extent is today's yield curve, the standard approach, uh, reflective of the same quality signal as we might have before. Now you talked about Fed policies. Fed policies have definitely uh, impacted the, the, the curve, the shape of the curve. Uh, but I would say, you know, a lot of instability in uh, Eastern Europe, in, in Venezuela, in the Middle East, those things also have impacts on the yield curve and people's appetite for buying it. And so we're trying to uh, find other measures beyond that to detach uh, the yield curve, um, actually decompose the yield curve into in a number of factors. So when you think about the yield curve, there's the prediction on the economy, and then there's something people call a term premium. And the term premium is uh, an extra fee you get for holding, for, for giving money to someone for a longer period of time, right? So if, you're, you, give a, if you buy a bond for, uh, for one year, uh, you should expect a lower term premium than if you give it for five years, because now you have four years of opportunity cost. Uh, what we've seen in the last few years is the term premium has shrunk, right? And, and it's shrunk uh, for reasons that are not well understood. But to the extent that it's shrunk, we should expect the yield curve to just be flatter anyway. Right? And so, so what we're trying to uh, uh, figure out is um, to what extent is this flatness really a signal of market expectations about the marketplace as opposed to uh, other dynamics that are affecting perceptions of the yield curve, of the term premium and other things. Uh, what I've, I've said this in the past, you know, if, I, if, if the market is providing a very strong signal that they think the economy is going into recession, uh, 
through the yield curve or other devices. I've got to take that seriously, right? And you know, I will. Uh, today, I, I think that the signal is less stark than the numbers are actually showing. Uh, and there are a number of ways, to, the reasons for why that is. So uh, this is a shameless plug. Uh, Atlanta Fed has a, a, a macro blog series. Uh, two weeks ago, we just released one on the yield curve that explains a lot of our thinking on this. Uh, you all should be on that anyway, right? So uh, I fully expect to see a little spike in our following. Um, but, but you should do that. And uh, we, we try to get thinking about a lot of things uh, in accessible ways uh, through that blog. I think it's very useful. That's great. Um, I'm going to actually take one of the online questions, and then, I'm, then I promise I'm coming to the live audience. But um, one of the questions we've had here, if the next recession hits soon, what could the Fed do, given that it still doesn't have that much room to cut interest rates? Everything. Everything we can, right? So, so I think uh, Chair Powell has said this, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I fully believe that this is true as well. You know, our, our mission is to... Uh, two things. All right, we have our dual mandate, and uh, we should not be bashful or shy in trying to ensure the economy continues to perform at the metrics that suggest that we meet that mandate. If we see that we're falling short, uh, I would be comfortable doing whatever it takes to get the economy uh, on its, back on its feet. And I would say that uh, you know, my interpretation of uh, the Fed's response to the Great Recession should give everyone confidence that the Fed's serious about that. Now, I was not at the body then, but the Fed did a bunch of things it had never done before, uh, all with the goal of making sure that the economy performed in a way that was uh, consistent with its mandate, and to make sure the economy didn't uh, go further away from that mandate. And so um, I definitely have that commitment, and I'm confident that my colleagues do as well. All right, let me invite some questions from the audience. Please identify yourself and um, make it brief since we have a range of interest. Uh, let's start with the gentleman in the blue shirt right here on the aisle. Um, that's you. Sarah, I have a question for you. Um, uh, the Fed, by adjusting interest rates, the intent is to increase uh, commercial loans. But uh, many commercial loans have a floor on them, so they become immune to changes in interest rates, particularly when they're at a very low level. Is the Fed able to take that into account? And do you feel that your, your ability to affect the market with interest rates is negated? So I don't think that, um, well, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I think that uh, when I think about policy, it's not only in the corporate lending space. Uh, corporate lending is one component of the broad uh, performance of the economy. And uh, it is something that, uh, that contributes to, but is not the sole determinant of, of the efficacy of policy. What I would say, though, is, I, and I have not looked at this directly, but it's not my sense that those financing tools and, and the arrangements are happening at a, a, a rate that would uh, remove full effectiveness of our policy. Uh, and when I talk to businesses, uh, what they tell me is that they're very sensitive to the cost of capital, uh, and they are continually engaging with capital markets to find ways to uh, do the things that they want to do. So I'm actually pretty confident that you know, our policies do still have uh, efficacy in transmitting the things that we're hoping to do. Uh, but you know, we, it's a question we're always asking, like what, what are the most effective ways that our policies, that our goals can be achieved, uh, and are our policies getting us close to being there? Thank you. Um, let's see. Let's go uh, this gentleman right here, please. Is the concentration of certain industries of fewer companies responsible for wages not taking off during a period of increased employment opportunities? So um, we actually just had a conference on this, uh, the Jackson Hole Conference. There was a lot of discussion about uh, this question. I would say that this is an unsettled question in the field. Uh, many have, have had the view that uh, the market is incredibly competitive, 
there's the ability to, for small companies to be quite disruptive uh, and you know, break down any kind of market power that might be had by large companies. Uh, I think some more recent uh, analyses suggest that there are some instances where market power is real and that that market power uh, may then allow firms and employers uh, to not have to be as responsive to uh, the competitive pressures in a marketplace. Uh, so I think this is unresolved. Uh, but this is a question that I think is uh, top shelf for understanding uh, how to interpret the data that's coming in. Uh, and in particular, at this conference I was at, uh, the Jackson Hole Conference, there was a lot of discussion about the superstar firms and uh, whether these firms, uh, because they had become so large, you know, the Apples and the Amazons and the like, that they could act preemptively to uh, stop the type of competition that we're talking about. So they just start buying up the competitive companies, uh, the small ones, and absorb them and either use their, their innovations or don't use them at all. Uh, and if, to the extent that that's becoming a larger share of the marketplace, uh, then that could translate into, into changes in sort of wage dynamics. Uh, we, and I've not seen analysis to suggest definitively that that's what's happening, but it is something that, that I, I spend some time thinking about. You know, I have my whole Amazon rant, uh, but <laughs> I'll spare you that today. Um, let's see. Uh, right over here, please. I was wondering what you think about the long-term viability of uh, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. I have uh, some friends who believe 50 years from now, you know, no one will use dollars or euros anymore because everyone will just use uh, Bitcoin or something like that. So I, um, I would say I don't understand it right now, and I don't see it right now. So the way those markets are operating, to my mind, they function much more like speculative asset markets than currency markets. Uh, and the, the, the dramatic rises and falls in value uh, should give anyone pause if you want to think about this in the context of currency. And so when I talk to people, what I usually tell them is, if you need that money tomorrow, this is probably not the market you want to be in, uh, because there's no guarantee that when you come to get it, uh, it will have the same value to buy the things that you actually need. Uh, so so I, I think that there's uh, something that needs to be figured out there to, uh, before it can really uh, substitute for the more conventional and the historical uh, uh, modes of transaction. Uh, there's a second piece, which you know, I, we were talking about this coming down here, uh, which is the blockchain in general is designed to promote anonymity and directness of relationships. Uh, and you know, in our country, we have a large apparatus designed around anti-money laundering and um, uh, 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 regulations to prevent the knowing contribution to activities that may be sort of black market or, or yeah, whatever, customer, all, all that kind of stuff. And the blockchain space is designed to do something very different. And until that gets resolved, until we find ways to have that happen, uh, I'm not really expecting many countries will actively endorse that as the, a primary means of, of engagement. Um, let's go all the way to the back, please. Uh, you mentioned that in your region, the economic recovery is not even. Uh, are you concerned that there is an increase in the gap between the do wells and the bottom part? And if yes, what should be done about it? So I am concerned about that uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, you know, we have a, a mandate of uh, maximum employment, maximum sustainable employment. And um, the question is, what's the definition of that? Right? Now, it could be 2 million people. It could be 5 million people. It could be 10 million people. And that's a function of how employable our, our population is, and what kind of innovation happens. Uh, to my mind, if we can achieve maximum employment with the 10 million as opposed to 2 million, 
we're all better off as a country. Right? So this, to me, is fundamental in terms of uh, trying to improve the economic experience for everyone and so that we become more productive collectively and uh, more people have a high quality of life. Right? So, so at a very basic level, uh, the fact that there are, are those that are right now outside of sharing in that, that is a source of concern. Um, in my district, I'm spending a lot of time going around to places that historically have not been seen as the go-getter economies. I was in Johnson City, Tennessee. I was in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Um, you guys probably don't even know what these places are. Uh, Muscle Shoals had a good, a good uh, a documentary, so you should go see that. Uh, but these places are interesting, and when I go to these places, the one thing I, I see consistently is real aspiration and hope and ambition and love of their place. And they want to do things to, to make those places better. And I feel like our institution has an obligation to meet them in that space and try to help them understand how the economy works, and then to the extent they ask for it or need uh, uh, assistance or a partner, to, to help them think about strategies to engage in today's economy in ways that have the potential to be uh, uh, successful. And so, so we're doing all of those sorts of things uh, in ways that uh, I, I hope, and I, I'm actually excited about it, uh, when I, I did not know how it was gonna go for me to go to these places, but the amount of hope that, that I've seen and the, the understanding that that something, some change was needed has been very helpful. And the last thing I'll say on this, um, the worst, thing we can, worst place we can get to is a place where the population stops believing that the economy can work for them. If they get hopeless uh, and stop uh, really participating, uh, then we get things like the opioid crisis. Then we get things like the crack epidemic that happened in uh, urban America in the 80s. Right? That's, those, are, those are symptoms of a larger issue. And so I want to make sure that we're not just standing on the sidelines and letting this stuff happen. I want to be proactive and have our institution really engage in that space. Are you getting to talk to K through 12 audiences at all to sort of encourage people to head off on the path as you described? So they're still afraid of me. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I, but I will tell you, uh, you know, uh, and this started before I got there, which has been very, very uh, gratifying. Uh, we engage with teachers, K through 12 teachers, a lot. Okay. So I have, uh, so in Georgia, they have a, a, a council for economic education. Many states have something comparable to that. Uh, we have been fortunate enough to take on two of uh, two members of the teaching corps who won Teacher of the Year. So they have a Teacher of the Year award for the economics instructor who has done the most inspiring or inspirational or um, innovative thing. Uh, and they are now starting to build curricula and engage. And if, I'm going to try as much as possible to help help them uh, push out more, get more in front of people. Next, I think next week, in two weeks, I'll be in Jackson, Mississippi, talking to the Mississippi Economic Education Group. And we're really trying to get out in front of people. And uh, hopefully at some point they'll they'll see the Fed. Young people will see the Fed as an institution that's interesting, that's fun, and then I can go start talking to them. Do you think that the problem is uh, their understanding of the field, or where the field is, or just the amount of, I mean, you and I will know this, you have to do a lot of math to get a PhD in economics. Is it things like that? What, what is the obstacle? Yeah, so I, I think that uh, there's two things. We've not done enough to just be accessible and talk about what we do and why it matters to people um, in ways that- We economists or you the Fed? Yes, I, I, I think we all can do better on this. Uh, and so, uh, so we need to do better than that. You know, I, we go to econ seminars and you hear economists talk and there's a lot of lingo and the elasticity this and all that kind of stuff. And for many people, it's just right over their head and they, they shut it down. I've talked to many, most states now have a requirement that students in, at some point in their, their, their primary, secondary education has to go take a class on financial literacy, on personal finance or something like that. When you, if you poll the students who go through the experience, they hate it. They hate the class. It's not interesting. They got me balancing a checkbook. Like young people don't 
really even know what a checkbook is. So, um, so, so we've got to make sure that as we engage, we're engaging in their space. And we're, re we're talking about these concepts in ways that are relevant and understandable for them. So they get jazzed about it. And, 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 and you know, having been a professor for a long time, you know, I've been, it's been beaten into my head that my references are not relevant. But the, the references I would use to describe a concept, and I'm, I'll never forget that I was in class and uh, uh, I was doing a policy class and we were talking about uh, single parenthood. And I said, Murphy Brown. And this was like, see, I bet half the people here don't even know who Murphy Brown is. Uh, but, but, oh, she's back now. I guess she's back. So now you know, there's, there's hope, yeah, right? right. Um, and the, the whole class, they had no idea who I was talking about. Yeah. And, and it was that point I was like, I got to change how I teach because I got to make sure that as I'm teaching, I'm doing it in a way that they understand it. Right? It's not, it's not, it doesn't help for me to understand it. I need to make sure I'm talking in that space. We need to do a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, I'm, I know the Fed as a system is committed to trying to make as much progress as possible and I'm going to push it as much as I can. Um, actually, I'm going to take a approach. We're getting, reaching the end of our time here. Um, just as a way to sort of think of this and include, you've now been, what, about 15 months, mm -hmm. President? Um, what sort of most, you talk about sort of people not understanding about the system, what does look different from the inside? You were obviously an accomplished economist before you came into this. What's looked different? What's sort of been most surprising from your sort of new vantage point? So, you know, I worked in the Fed system before. And so um, I knew kind of what the Fed was. And I understood there's a Fed way and Fed speak and all that kind of stuff. I think for me, the thing that has been most uh, surprising or required the most adjustment is being in the CEO position. And um, that, required, that, 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 that brings with it a level of scrutiny uh, on a continuous basis that I just never had to experience before. You know, I, I only half joke, like when you're a professor and you're in a class, you know that 30% of the class is not paying attention to you at any time. Um, when you're the CEO of a company, you walk into a room, everyone is paying attention to you all the time. And that's true for an audience like this where you, know, you guys have come to listen to me talk, but it is true when I'm walking down the hallway in the building, I'm on the elevator, I'm in the cafeteria, I'm in a meeting, and um, that, it, it took me a couple of weeks just to get used to the fact that you know, I'm effectively on camera all the time. And so you know, my energy level's gotta be up, my engagement has gotta be up, my in the moment focus has got to be there all the time. Uh, and that, that's, that's very different. So you know, I, don't, I don't walk around with my cell phone anymore, so I don't do that, you know, most people do the head, I can't do that. Because if I walk past someone and I don't say hello, you know, that becomes a, a story in the building, right? And so it's a, it's a different type of experience, uh, but it's been incredibly rich because it's meant that I now, I have to, I'm purposefully engaging people. I want people to be comfortable with me. I want people to be able to talk to me uh, because that's how I learn about things uh, in our institution, but also across the country. Uh, and that will help me make better decisions. Well, that's the time we have uh, for this evening. Thank you all for paying attention. Please join me in thanking uh, President Bostic for coming and engaging with us. Thank you. Thank you. And we will be having a networking reception for about the next half hour or so uh, if you would like to join us in the back.